Good afternoon, good evening, brothers and sisters. Pastor Danny here, Oceanside United Reformed Church. Uh, it's Sunday, January 17th, and uh, this afternoon we'll be uh, praying and uh, leading you through a short little study here of baptism um, for our second uh, service. It's going to be, uh, as we've been for a little bit here, just pre-recorded and for us to uh, to watch together. So hopefully you're watching us on Sunday uh, afternoon, evening, and uh, trying to rest and uh, enjoy the Lord's Day as best you can. I um, encourage you to share the uh, our, our YouTube channel, share the sermon message and the teaching that you hear with your friends and family and uh, co-workers um, as best you're able to, um, to spread the word, the good word of the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, for, for members, you have an email that comes out every week that has our, uh, after, our, our morning and our afternoon service, our liturgy, uh, the songs, and so forth. So for this afternoon, um, you have uh, that as well with uh, just a short time of prayer, and we'll read a psalm, and then uh, we'll look to the Word for a few minutes here. Uh, this is a, just a really short version, short sort of contemporary form of um, the old Reformed uh, liturgy called the Book of Common Prayer. And uh, if you have a copy of that, uh, you can search it online. You'll see, uh, you know, the old language, uh, the old verbiage, and the full liturgy. This is just a short uh, version of that. So uh, this season of the year, we celebrate the, the manifestation, the revelation of Jesus, the Son of God in human flesh, to the world, to the nations, to the Gentiles, uh, myself included. And so this uh, second Sunday after Epiphany, or the manifestation, the revelation of that Son of God to the, to the Gentiles, we read in the prophecy of Isaiah a wonderful uh, image and vision of that and uh, encourages us as well, saying, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. We have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son, John 1 tells us. His glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising, and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. As the Son of God in human flesh has manifested himself and revealed himself to the Gentiles, to the Magi first, and to us, let's respond by bringing to him our praise, our prayers, our petitions, as we ask the Lord to hear us and to help us uh, in our time of need. And so let's pray responsibly, saying, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Amen. May the Lord be praised this afternoon. And uh, we sing, normally we sing through the Psalms of the Old Testament. Uh, the, the Psalms of the Old Testament prophesy and speak forward, of course, of the coming Messiah, our Lord Jesus. And so we can look back and sing them and pray them and read them, uh, knowing that he is the Lord uh, spoken of here in the Psalms. And so this afternoon, Psalm 138. I'm going to read that with you. Uh, and as, as I read it and as you're listening, uh, may it be your prayer as well. I give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you've exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. But the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Praise the Lord for that preserving power uh, of our Lord himself. When he tells us in John chapter 10, He's the good shepherd. We are the sheep. He tells us that nothing can snatch us from the Father's hand. Nothing can snatch us from his own hand. Why? Because I and the Father are one. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Praise Jesus for his preserving power and his work in our lives. Let's give him praise as we uh, say together with one voice and with one heart the ancient Christian hymn, Gloria Patri, or Glory to the Father. 
uh, in response to hearing this beautiful psalm. Let's praise God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let's pray this afternoon. Uh, there's a series of short little prayers that we use that encourage us and pray for various needs that we have. Uh, and I pray that these prayers, as we read them and as we pray them uh, often, become uh, prayers of our own heart. So as we memorize them with our head, may they become the prayers of our own heart. So let's pray together, first of all, for this second Sunday after Epiphany. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and earth, mercifully hear the supplications of your people and grant us your peace all the days of our life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all of God's people say, Amen. Let's also pray for peace. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended by you from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all of God's people say, Amen. Let's also pray for aid against all perils. Enlighten our darkness, we beseech you, O Lord. And by your great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people say, Amen. We finally conclude with a prayer of thanksgiving uh, with our uh, prayers from the Book of Common Prayer. The general thanksgiving is on both sides of the order of service this afternoon. Uh, praying those uh, bold printed words with our lips, but especially with our hearts. Together saying, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, do give you most humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we beseech you, give us that due sense of all your mercies, that our hearts may be sincerely thankful, and that we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Let's also uh, pray for the needs of our church and give God thanks for uh, just a wonderful Lord's Day. Uh, it was a great morning uh, down by the beach and uh, encourage you to meditate again upon the wonderful satisfaction that Jesus alone can give to our souls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless and praise you for your wonderful word. Uh, we heard this morning from John, uh, from Mark chapter 6, from Mark chapter 6, that uh, Lord, you are the Savior from sin, the Savior of sinners, the satisfier of souls. And we ask, Lord, just as you satisfied your ancient people in the wilderness by providing manna from heaven, the same way, Heavenly Father, as you gave them rest in the wilderness, that in Jesus Christ we might find that greater shepherd who guides and leads us so that we are not like a sheep, not like sheep without a shepherd, who gives to us rest in the wilderness of this age, this life, and who provides us from heaven, not with earthly bread, but himself, the true manna, the true bread, and also the Lord, the true water that came out of the rock. We bless and praise you for satisfying us, Lord, and we pray that there would be uh, just a great mighty work of your spirit amongst us as your, as your church, as our church family here in Oceanside. Uh, Father, that uh, those who heard the gospel this morning, who did not know you, uh, Lord, who are, uh, who've, who've turned from you, uh, Lord, any who are uh, not serious about you or who are even, Lord, ignorant or doubting you, struggling, with, that they would come to know Jesus in a powerful way. For the rest of us, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts and strengthen our faith, so that we would be bold witnesses, that we would be ourselves satisfied in you and be willing to testify of that satisfaction that you alone can give. And so, Lord, give us this very week opportunities to share the good news of Jesus, to talk about how he satisfies and Lord, how politics and power and uh, privilege and position and all the things of this life, ultimately, Lord, can't satisfy our souls. Only you can. We, we thank you, Lord, for all who attended this morning and for all, the, all, all of our members, our church family. 
uh, all of our friends, Lord, and the neighbors, and all those who uh, traveled through and found us today. And Again, Lord, uh, we bless and praise that we have a place to meet, that we can gather together. We pray for our favor, Lord, with the government, and with our state, and with our county. And uh, Lord, we thank you for our host, the Army Navy Academy. We, we pray for wisdom and blessing upon all these uh, various uh, layers that we that we deal with every day. Uh, we pray, Father, for uh, what's going on in our time, uh, that you would remove your hand from our nation, that we would that we would be uh, freed from this fear and this virus, Lord, all the effects of it and the damaging struggles that it brings. Father, help us to be content in you. Help us to trust in you alone as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Father, help our country to peacefully transition power this week. Uh, Father, that we might see in that uh, just a small, small glimmer uh, of the peace that you alone can give. As we pray, the peace that passes all understanding that the world can't give, but only you can. Help us, Lord, to support and to pray for and to live godly lives, Lord, in quiet lives, as your word calls us to do. Uh, despite uh, the party in power, the parties, Lord, that vie and the personalities, Lord, help us to be good servants of Jesus Christ, to be bold witnesses. Help us to be stable uh, in an age of complete instability. May we be the rock, Lord, that people look to, the place of comfort, the place of rest, the place of refuge. Uh, Lord, the hospital for sinners, the place where people can come, Lord, from all uh, languages, peoples, tribes, nations, Lord, all ethnicities and colors and and uh, and jobs, Lord, and backgrounds and cultures that we would find in the Church of Jesus, Lord, at Oceanside URC as well as everywhere, uh, Lord, a microcosm of heaven itself. We bless and praise you. Uh, we ask now that you would open up our eyes to behold the wonderful things that are found in your word, that we would know your truth and cling to it, Lord, dearly this very week. We ask all this in Jesus' powerful and precious name, and all of God's people say, Amen. Well, uh, this afternoon, I want to uh, read with you and uh, meditate with you for a few minutes on uh, s uh, various Bible passages, um, as well as some questions and answers from the Heidelberg Catechism that are going to guide us in terms of our big idea and the big theme and just a big topic that we want to look at this afternoon, which is the outward and inward aspects of uh, holy baptism. So if you have a copy of the Heidelberg Catechism... Uh, grab a hold of that or pull it up in your phone or on your computer screen and turn with me to Lord's Day number 26. So Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number 26. Uh, just have that open, have a Bible open as well. Uh, there's also a little sermon notes page for you in the weekly email with a quick little um, outline of uh, this afternoon's uh, topic and, uh, and study. So, uh, we, we've seen so far in uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, we saw this last uh, Sunday afternoon, last Lord's Day, that it is the Holy Spirit. We, we believe in the Holy Spirit, we confess in the Apostles' Creed, uh, the, the Nicene Creed. He's the Lord and giver of life. Uh, we embrace the fullness of the person and work of the Holy Spirit as uh, Reformed Protestant Christians. The Holy Spirit is the one uh, who... Of the three persons of the triune God is uh, revealed and known for uh, and is the, is the agent, is the powerful means by which God creates faith in our hearts. That he gives us the gift of faith. Uh, he kindles it. We saw last Sunday from uh, questions, uh, from question and answer 65 in our catechism that, that the Holy Spirit kindles, uh, like, like, like kindling a fire, uh, he kindles or he creates faith in our hearts through the preaching of the gospel. This is why it's so important for us to not only read the word, but hear it proclaimed uh, in a public way with a church family in an assembly of Christians. To hear it proclaimed, whether it's in a small house uh, or in a large cathedral. We've got to hear the gospel proclaimed to us uh, from, a, from, a, uh, from, from a called and ordained and sent uh, minister of the good news. Uh, and so God uses that by the Spirit of God to create in our hearts faith. He also, God knows our frame. He knows that we're like dust. And so he gives to us also a second aid. Uh, he gives us what we call sacraments to not create, but to confirm the faith that we have. So it's like, um, you know, in the ancient world, there were kings, they would give a decree. People would hear that and they would, of course, have to obey and follow. One of the ways that the, the king would 
uh, assure to his subjects that he really said, um, you know, I'm going to protect you or uh, I need from you a certain tax or, you know, there's a festival day coming up or a day off of work, a holy day, a festival day and so forth. Uh, one of the ways that they would know that was that he would put that decree in writing. It would be read out loud to their ears, but then that would be posted up, say, on a church wall or on a castle door somewhere. Uh, and then his ring had a little signet, right? It had a picture, an image of himself, and a symbol, and some words possibly. And they would take that scroll and they would put a, they would melt wax onto it, and he would impress his signet ring on that document to authenticate, to assure, to testify, to confirm to his people that he really has made this decree. In the same way, we hear the gospel preached to us from our King Jesus, and to assure us that what we've heard is real. Right? We, we struggle with faith and, and we wonder, you know, is what the gospel says, God so loved the world, does that really apply to me? God says yes. He gives us the sacraments, baptism and communion. It's like he's putting a stamp of approval. He's putting a signet ring. Uh, he's impressing that, you know, as it were, in the wine and on the bread and in the water, so to speak. To assure us, to comfort us, to confirm in us. Um, and this is true not just once, right? This is true our whole life. Uh, our, uh, our whole lives, all of our lives, uh, that we hear the gospel and we receive sacraments. Faith created, faith is confirmed. And so we hear that we hear the gospel for the first time when we come to know the Lord and we receive the sacraments. We were baptized once uh, as the sign that we we're included into the covenant of God, the people of God. But it's an ongoing hearing the word, an ongoing remembering our baptism, and an ongoing receiving communion uh, that confirms. And so he confirms our faith by the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. We saw in question 66 last Sunday, if you have the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, you can just read this for yourself, but it says that sacraments are visible, holy signs and seals instituted by God so that by our use of them, He, God, might make us understand more clearly the promise of the gospel and seal that promise. So, the sign and the seal, right? To make it more clear to us that the gospel is for us. The gospel is for me. Let's focus this afternoon on the sacrament of baptism. Baptism has a sign. What's the sign? The sign of baptism is water. And there's also a thing that is signified. So there's a sign, right? I mentioned last Sunday the illustration of on Coast Highway in Oceanside that we have these blue signs that have a big wave on it and a person running, uh, and it's a, it's a sign pointing to a tsunami shelter. The sign itself, right, if you, if you just stand underneath the pole, under that sign, you're not going to be safe from a tsunami. You have to go to the place. The, th the thing that's signified by that sign is the actual shelter. So, in the same way, there's a thing that's signified, and we learned, uh, we'll see this afternoon, the thing that's signified is uh, the blood of Christ and the Spirit of Christ. The blood and the Spirit of of Christ. And there's a promise in sacraments. There's a promise in baptism uh, that Christ has given this to us, that it's of his authority that he says, this water signifies my blood washing away your sins. This water signifies uh, my spirit cleansing your soul from all of its impurities. So I want to focus with you on baptism uh, there's an outward and an inward aspect. There's the outward thing, there's the sign, there's the water. There's an inward thing, the thing that signified the blood and spirit of Christ. So if you notice in the outline that you have, or if you're listening for the first time here, you don't have that outline in front of you, uh, question and answer 69 from our Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number 26, how baptism assures us. How baptism assures us. Um, Notice the question, how does holy baptism remind and assure you that Christ's one sacrifice on the cross benefits you personally? Benefits you personally. So we, we don't use baptism. We don't baptize out of mere tradition and custom. But this is a living faith. This is a living faith. Amen? Amen. Baptism must benefit you and me personally, right? Because it's without faith, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. 
we must have faith, right? This, this question is written to us as the community, the believing people, the professing people of God. How does holy baptism, question 69, remind you and assure you that Christ's one sacrifice on the cross benefits you personally in this way? Christ instituted this outward washing and with it promised that as surely as water washes away the dirt from the body, so surely his blood and his spirit wash away my soul's impurity. That is all my sins. So there's an outward aspect and there's an inward aspect of baptism. The outward washing, of course, we can see that in texts like Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go uh, into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's this outward washing, baptizing with water. Or in Acts chapter 2, in the day of Pentecost, when Peter preaches, uh, and the people uh, are cut to the heart of the Holy Spirit, and they, and they cry out, you know, what then should we do? And he says, Repent, believe, be baptized, so the washing away of your sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit will be given to you uh, and uh, to all who are afar off. So there's an outward aspect of, wa uh, of washing. As surely as, there's this parallelism that's mentioned here. As surely as water washes away dirt from the body, as surely as you take a bath or a shower, you wash your hands, right? During this pandemic, we have to wash our hands often. As surely as you wash your hands, the dirt right? The impurities, uh, the bacteria, uh, the virus, whatever it is that's stuck to our skin. As surely as water washes away dirt from the body, that's the outward aspect of baptism, so surely, so certainly, notice, his blood and his spirit wash away my soul's impurity. That is all my sins. So there's water, there's Christ's bl uh, blood and spirit. There's an outward washing, there's an inward washing. John once said it like this in Matthew chapter 3 when, when the baptizer was preaching out in the, uh, in the Judean wilderness outside the, uh, 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 of the Judean, uh, in the countryside by the Jordan River. He said, I baptize you with water. This is the outward part of uh, the sign. I baptize you with water. But there's one coming who is mightier than I, I can't even unloose his sandal strap. He will baptize you with what? With the Holy Spirit and fire. The Holy Spirit and fire. So there's an outward baptism. There's water. There's an inward baptism. There's a spirit and fire. Why fire? It's such an interesting Im image, uh, isn't it? When we read John say that in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter number three. Because in the Old Testament, uh, the imagery of fire is not just a judgment. There is that. But it's also a cleansing image. Fire can be a judgment. Think of Sodom and Gomorrah. God sends fire down out of heaven. Uh, think of Nadab and Abihu, uh, uh, Aaron's sons. In Leviticus chapter 10, God sends fire down to consume them and to kill them. But fire is also a cleansing image. It's a purification. Fire is used to purify away uh, from metal, right? All the alloy and all the, all the impurities so that it's pure silver, pure gold. Or, or fire, you know, we live here in San Diego, we have, a lot of, we have fire season and the fire goes through uh, various wooded areas and, and brush fires and so forth. And it, and it really purifies and it cleanses. And then you see like amazing growth afterwards. So there's the outward water. There's the inward, the Holy Spirit and fire. Also in Romans chapter number 6, if you read that text, Romans chapter number 6, verses 3 through 10, uh, we are, uh, Paul there tells us that we were buried with Christ by baptism into his death. So baptism, right, the outward aspect, the outward part, the outward thing, the sign, we were buried with Christ by baptism into his death, the inward aspect, his blood and his spirit, as the, as the catechism says. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, one of, one of the texts that you might notice if you have a catechism and it has the little footnotes, you'll see 1 Peter 3 verse number 21 mentioned there. It's a very uh, difficult and controversial passage, but uh, the point of it being used here is this: that baptism now uh, it was a it was a uh, it's a, it's the reality of a of a sign or a type from the Old Testament, which was the ark. So there's the ark of safety that protected Noah and his believing family in the book of Genesis when God sent a flood, and now there's baptism. That is the thing that corresponds to the ark. But it's interesting. Peter says it's 
that baptism is not the removal of dirt from the body. That's just the outward aspect of baptism. There's also an inward aspect, but it's an appeal to God for a good conscience. It's a, 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 in baptism, we appeal to God to be cleansed, to be purified, uh, to be made new through Jesus Christ. So, so how does baptism assure us? It assures us when we see a little ones baptized, when we see a convert baptized, when we participate in that it assures us that just as surely as we see that water placed upon a baby or a or a toddler or a uh, an older child uh, or a or a uh, an aged adult who converts to Jesus and comes to know Him in the last days of his or her life, as surely as we see that water put upon their body, which sing- signifies a cleansing, right? So surely it, it tells us that Christ's blood and Spirit wash away uh, the impurities of our souls. That is our sins. That's how baptism works. So what is this washing? That's the next question that you'll see there in question 70 from the Heidelberg Catechism. So baptism assures us of uh, not just an outward but an inward washing. But what's the washing, right? It's really interesting. What's the washing that it's describing there? Because we we know what the washing is outwardly because we wash our hands every day. We take a shower, take a bath. We see the baby baptized or the adult convert baptized. We see that, that, that symbol, the water, the outward thing. But we don't see that inward, right? The blood and the spirit washing away our sins, our souls and purity. Question 70 asks us this. What does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? So it goes on to explain now question number 69. To be washed with Christ's blood means that God by grace has forgiven our sins because of Christ's blood poured out for us in his sacrifice on the cross. That's the first aspect. The second aspect, to be washed with Christ's Spirit means that the Holy Spirit has renewed and sanctified us to be members of Christ so that more and more we die to sin and live holy and blameless lives. So what is washing? Notice the first and the second parts of that. There's the blood of Christ and there's the Spirit of Christ. It means to be washed by Christ's blood. Uh, this is speaking of forgiveness, right? The cleansing, the, the forgiveness, the washing away of our sins. Or we might say it testifies to us of our justification that we have in Jesus Christ alone by faith. But it's also testifying of the Holy Spirit, the washing and the renewal of our souls from its daily impurities. So we have justification by Christ's blood. We have sanctification by Christ's Spirit. Uh, there's a wonderful prophecy of this in Zechariah chapter 13, verse number 1, that describes a day to come. And the prophet says, in that day, that's one of those prophetic markers. When you read the minor prophets of the, of the major prophets, and they say something like, in that day, in those days, on that day, uh, afterwards, and so forth. They're speaking of, they're pro- prophesying the new covenant, the days of the Messiah. And Zechariah 13, 1 says, you know, in that day, there's going to be this fountain there's going to be this fountain of water that washes away not bodily dirt, but sins. And it's testifying, it's prophesying a day to come in which there's the forgiveness of sins, the cleansing blood of Christ for all nations and all peoples for a complete remission of all of our sins. Uh, if you have a Bible, let's, let's turn to a passage. I've been, I've been reading these passages for you, uh, but let's turn to one together uh, that testifies to us and speaks to us of what the washing is in terms of the the washing of Christ's blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Ephesians 1. Uh, Ephesians 1, please. Uh, And there we see this. Um, This is a great passage. Um, Of course, it begins, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ goes on to describe our being predestined, and then it talks about uh, the end of it, about being sealed of the Holy Spirit. In the middle, it describes for us redemption in Christ. We have a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a Trinitarian hymn of praise here. Predestination by the Father, redemption by the Son, sealing by the Holy Spirit. And notice what Paul says, or he praises God for, in terms of what Christ has done. When he says to us, uh, verse 6, to the, uh, all this, to the praise of God's glorious grace, with which, 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 with which grace he's blessed us in the beloved, meaning the Son, his Son. 
in him, verse 7, in the Son, the beloved Son of the Father, the eternal Son of the eternal Father, in him we have redemption through his blood. What does that mean? The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, which he lavished upon us. What does it mean to be washed with the blood of Jesus Christ? It means that in him I am redeemed. That is, I am bought back from slavery to sin. And his blood forgives me of all those sins. He takes away all those debts. Interestingly, he used the language here of the forgiveness of our trespasses, our, our actually violating the laws of God, our actually going into debt, as it were, against God. Jesus' blood washes us, cleanses us, frees us, liberates us, redeems us from all those trespasses against God's law. And God has done this in Christ. He's so done, uh, done it so that he says he lavishes. He absolutely overflows upon us this grace. This is, this is Romans chapter 5, where our sins abound, uh, Romans 5, 20 and 21. Uh, God's grace super abounds above and beyond all of our sins. So to be washed with the blood of Christ is to find in him the fullness of our redemption. And the water of baptism as a sign testifies of this inward reality of full washing, full forgiveness. Right, so there's sort of a there's sort of a um, uh, there's an analogy there between outward washing and inward washing. But notice how the the outward washing can can only be just a faint a faint image of uh, of the inward, and the inward is so much more than even the sign, the outward sign, because we we have, you and I have to wash our hands every day. We're hearing that all the time. You know, you got to wash your hands multiple times a day, uh, at least 20 seconds, right, under running hot water, typically with with soap, antibacterial soap. So that we don't pass on virus, we don't get, 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 get people sick, right? Uh, we take a bath, we take a shower, uh, we have hand sanitizer, we have baby wipes, right? We're always thinking about cleanliness in our society. But that's an ongoing, continual, never-ending thing. And so the analogy kind of, it, it, it breaks down because what we're talking about in Christ is a once and for all, uh, a completed Final thing, it is finished, right? It is finished. In Revelation 1, let's turn to one more text here. Revelation 1, there's another uh, wonderful passage of praise uh, that I want to read for you. A wonderful passage of praise in Revelation 1 uh, at verse 5 when, when John is writing this wonderful uh, vision, Revelation. Uh, he says to us, Grace to peace from him who is, who was, who was to come, and from the seven spirits who are before us throne. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, grace and peace from Jesus, who is the faithful witness. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler of kings on earth. And then John praises him to him who loves us and has freed us. Notice that. Notice that. Has already perfectly, completedly freed us from our sins. How? By his blood. That's what we have in Christ. And God knows that we hear that message and we struggle with the, to believe it for ourselves, to apply it to ourselves every day. And so God says, I know this. And so I have given you sacraments. And we're thinking about baptism here. Baptism outwardly tells us of this amazing inwardly being washed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is washing? It's to be cleansed. It's to be forgiven. It's to be justified. It's to be accepted. It's to be redeemed, right? All these amazing biblical images and terms. To have all of that, every spiritual blessing in Christ. It's also to be washed with Christ's spirit, meaning that we are sanctified. That we are sanctified. Uh, turn with me to, to, to an amazing prophecy of this in Ezekiel chapter 36. Uh, Ezekiel chapter number 36. What's this inward washing that baptism testifies of? So in Ezekiel 36, this is a prophecy. And the Israelites, uh, in their exile in Babylon, because of their sins, the prophets were constantly reminding them of their sins, their trespasses, their debts, right? Their deadness and sins and so forth before God. 
The Lord, though, promised a day to come. He's saying, brothers and sisters, there's going to be a day when you're you're brought out of captivity and bondage. I will I will liberate you once again like I did the Israelites out of Egypt. But notice that the Lord is saying in Ezekiel 36 that in that day to come, when I do that by the Messiah, that there's more than just an outward redemption, as amazing as that was. No, the Lord says the fullness of what that means is going to be revealed in that day. So in Ezekiel chapter 36, speaking of the Israelite sins, uh, notice in verse 22, for example, um, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. Why is God going to redeem the Israelites? Not because of them, but because of himself, which you have profaned. Notice the, the language of impurity here. You've profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, uh, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Notice this. I will take you from the nations. He's speaking of their exile to bring them back. Assyria, the Babylonians, right? The northern kingdom, Israel, the southern Judah. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. This is what happened when uh, the Lord began to do that in the in the restoration. And of course, we see it in Acts 2 when all the faithful Israelites and God-fearers from all the surrounding nations came to Jerusalem and they heard the gospel. They were all gathered in one place. It's amazing. Uh, and I will bring you to your own land. Notice verse 25. Here's what God is saying. There's a day to come when I'm going to do the reality of what the, the liberation from Egypt and this liberation from Babylon and Assyria is picturing. There's something greater to come. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. Notice who's doing the action here. It's God. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. Notice the, the outward cleansing of water, right? It is, typic, it is symbolic of the, of the Father uh, the Lord cleansing, giving a new heart, giving a new spirit, uh, uh, and and putting his spirit within. And by doing that, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules, not to profane my statutes and my rules and my holy name. So when we say that to be washed uh, with the water outwardly tip, uh, signifies and seals the inward cleansing of the Holy Spirit, that is coming right from the prophecy of Ezekiel. And isn't it interesting that that finds its fulfillment in the New Testament in John chapter 3. When Jesus meets Nicodemus at night and he tells Nicodemus, I, uh, Amen, Amen, or truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? You must be born of what? Water and the Spirit. <laughs> Water and the Spirit. What do we see in Ezekiel? I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and put my Spirit within you. Ezekiel is speaking of, uh, of being born again, of being cleansed, of being renewed, of being uh, regenerated, of being sanctified in an ongoing way. And so Jesus is using that Ezekiel language and saying, that's come true. Unless you're cleansed by me and my Spirit is put within you, you cannot enter into my kingdom. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. And we learn as well in Romans chapter 6, just quickly, if you want to read Romans 6 again and look at verse 4, uh, we talk about there, or Paul talks about there, uh, that we were buried with Christ uh, into his death by baptism so that we might walk in newness of life. We are justified and we are sanctified. Baptism, it's by baptism outwardly that we are put into Christ and we by the Spirit uh, begin to walk in a new life. So we've seen here, uh, quickly to recap before uh, before I look at the last and final point quickly, uh, how baptism assures us. It assures us because there's an outward thing that we can touch and see and even taste in communion, and there's an inward reality that God is doing. Well, what is that? What is that inward reality? It's to be washed. To be how by Christ's blood and the cross and by His Holy Spirit poured on the day of Pentecost that come to us by faith. Don't ever forget. You know this is speaking to us uh, of uh, uh, as believers that we must believe this stuff to be true. Now we're going to see next Sunday, Lord willing, in question 74, that this is also true of our children, right? that our children are also included together in the congregation, the church, the covenant, the people of God. Uh, and for them, 
uh, these things are made as promises uh, to them in baptism. And we as parents are responsible to teach our little ones uh, the reality. By faith, you come to receive Christ, to be washed of your sins. By faith, you come to be renewed by the Holy Spirit, to walk in newness of life. And so that reality is true of all those. Uh, the sign and seal are true of all those who are baptized, whether you're an adult convert or an infant, because it has to be received by faith. We have to embrace it for ourselves. That's why, again, question seven, uh, 69, how does uh, holy baptism remind you and assure you that Christ, one sacrifice on the cross, benefits you personally? You personally. So where does Scripture teach this? Quickly. Question and answer 71. Uh, where does Christ promise that we are washed with his blood and spirit as surely as we are washed with the water of baptism? And the answer is that it comes to us in the institution of baptism, Go therefore and make disciples, and so forth, Matthew 28. Uh, Mark 6, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And finally, this promise is repeated when Scripture calls baptism the washing of regeneration, Titus 3, verse 5. Uh, the washing of sins, Acts 22, verse number 16. So again, Matthew 28, verse number 19. Uh, go and baptizing, right? Being Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the outward thing. Okay, in, in to do to be baptizing what? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the inward thing, right? There's, there's, uh, uh, it's as if uh, Zacharias Ursinus, the uh, main author of our catechism, Z Ursinus says uh, those, that language of being baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's as if God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit themselves baptized. Because that to put the name of Father, Son, Spirit on a person in baptism means that God claims that person uh, for his own. God is saying, you are mine. You are mine. And I sign and seal to you all the promises of God. The washing away of your sins. The cleansing of the Holy Spirit. As if God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit baptized. Mark 16 again describes, uh, here describes... Uh, uh, the outward and inward, right? Those, uh, it's he who believes and is baptized will be saved, right? That's the inward aspect. So the baptism is linked together with, joined together with faith, believing. Baptism and believing go together. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, will receive the benefits uh, signified and sealed in baptism. Titus chapter 3, verse uh, 5, where uh, Paul describes the washing of regeneration by... Uh, the Holy Spirit, and again, Acts 22, verse 16, uh, where, where Paul says, uh, uh, in answer to the question of what should we do to be saved, and he says, Arise, believe, be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name uh, of the Lord. So one objection to this, which is one to consider just for a quick moment, uh, is that the Bible attributes salvation to both faith and baptism, it sounds like. So is it received by faith or is it received by baptism? And the answer goes something like this. And again, this comes right from Zacharias Ursinus. He was the main author of our Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, and he says in his lectures on the Heidelberg Catechism uh, that Christ attributes salvation to both faith and baptism, but not to both alike. So in Mark 16 says, uh, he who believes and is baptized. Or in Paul says, uh, that that uh, the Holy Spirit is the washing of regeneration. Or when Paul says, again in Acts 22, that you have to arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. Christ attributes salvation to both faith, uh, believing and baptism, but not to both alike. Meaning this, he, is, he attributes salvation to faith as the means of salvation. We, are, we receive salvation by the means of faith and faith alone. But he also attributes salvation to baptism as the sign whereby salvation is sealed to us. In other words, we don't forget that we are justified by faith alone, but that that, that justification and that salvation, all that it means to be a believer, uh, is signified and sealed and it's described for us and it's tangibly put before us in the sacraments of baptism and communion. So that when we receive baptism, or when we participate in a baptism of another, and we remember our own baptism, when we receive the Lord's Supper, we are receiving by faith all the benefits of it for ourselves. 
at that very moment. All the benefits of, ourself, uh, of it for ourselves at that very moment. For they who are baptized, as uh, Ursinus to conclude said this, for they who are baptized cannot receive that which is promised and sealed in baptism, but by faith. But by faith. We'll see more of that next Lord's Day, Lord willing, the next questions and answers of the Heidelberg Catechism. But I want to uh, encourage you in conclusion, brothers and sisters, uh, to remember that God uses baptism to assure you, uh, to give you certainty that he's claimed you for his own. I want to encourage you, uh, and we as a congregation, as a church family, as we get to celebrate baptisms of little ones here soon, uh, in the next couple of Sundays, Lord willing, uh, that uh, we should all, as we see that little one being baptized and the parents bringing them up, not, not just remember our baptism, but to love these little children, uh, to support these parents who bring their children to be baptized, uh, to pray for them, to, to encourage them. To, uh, to talk about parenting with them, to talk about raising them as Christians, uh, to, uh, uh, to encourage our children, even as little ones, to have fellowship in Jesus' name together. And, and we as a congregation to celebrate the fact that we have uh, so many little ones and, uh, and older members and all in between, all together as one body. Right? We are coming together as one body uh, to worship and to pray and to hear the word and to sing, uh, to encourage each other, to fellowship. And I pray that our church would be stirred up, and I pray that you would be stirred up. As we think about the outward, but also the inward parts of baptism, that you would be stirred up uh, to a genuine faith, to embrace yourself, and because of that, to be stirred up to a true love and to good works. The world needs this, doesn't it? The, the world needs us to show love. For us to show love. God has so loved us that he claims us for his own, and he gives us a sign of baptism. So let's love him. Let's love one another. Let's love the world around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless this uh, uh, meditation upon your word and the teaching of it, the doctrines of, the, the, of, of our faith. Encourage our hearts, we pray today, so that we might be a living epistle, a living witness of your amazing grace to us, that you've washed away uh, our souls of all of its uncleanness. You've accepted us once and for all in Jesus Christ, and you are continually to, uh, continuing to work in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Bless us today. Encourage us. Build our church family, Lord. Help us, Lord, to reach out to, to our community, uh, to come to know this wonderful and precious and uh, uh, lavish grace and love of Jesus Christ for sinners like us. We love you, Lord. We ask that you would bless this week coming up to your glory and honor. We ask in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. Loved ones, go out with God. Go in peace. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and with me, with all of us, both now and forever. Amen.